Greetings. Thank you for joining Trinity Church on this Good Friday. My name is Laura Wessels. I'm a member of Trinity Church as well as an elder here and a pastor in the Reformed Church in America. And it's my privilege to lead you in this Good Friday service where we're going to take a journey as we follow Jesus to the cross. And I'm so grateful to you for joining me on this journey. Would you pray with me? Oh Lord, so often we have said, there is no Easter without Good Friday. And Lord, we are here on Good Friday where it's so evident to us how much you love us through what you went through as you died on the cross. Lord, we acknowledge our own participation in that event. And we focus tonight, Lord, not so much on victory, but on your pain and your sacrifice and your love for us. Lord, would you walk with us even now on this journey? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Jesus journeyed to the cross. It began when Jesus gathered with his disciples to celebrate Passover. But that's not right. It began well before that, as a matter of fact, the night that Jesus arrived, born in a stable in the crowded town of Bethlehem. You know, that's not right either. It really began, the very beginning was all the way back in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve chose to trust in themselves instead of God, when they rebelled by eating the one fruit that God had kept from them. That's where this began. And God, right then, in his justice and his mercy, he made a way. And he marked the starting line to the cross and to our salvation. He outlined his plan to the three of them, Adam and Eve and the snake. In Genesis 3 verse 15, when he speaks directly to Satan, I will put contempt between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. They will strike your head but you will strike at their heels. The first promise of a savior is found in God's words here of the serpent's head being crushed. God chose to implement his plan with Abraham, developing a nation through him, a nation that would produce God's son, Jesus. God created laws, and a way of worshiping that would help this people recognize Jesus when he arrived. The Passover feast of slaughtered lamb and unleavened bread reminded them of how God had delivered them from slavery. They were commanded to offer animal sacrifices for forgiveness of their sins. God called his people to follow him, the one true God, the one who led them out of slavery in Egypt. Yet Jesus' ancestors, his great-great-grandparents, and all of his family members, they failed to trust God. They were punished, and then they cried out to God, and God would restore them. And the cycle began all over again, failing trusting in themselves instead of God, rebellion against God, over and over and over and over again. Amidst this cycle came the promise of Messiah, the one who would make work of an ultimate restoration. Isaiah prophesied that the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Would you join me on this journey to the cross as we use the windows of Trinity Church to guide our way? When Jesus did arrive, 
He was mostly unrecognized. His birth was so obscure. A manger for a bed. Only a bright star alerting a few others that this was the birthplace of a king. Jesus' public ministry, brief as it was, began with his own baptism. Did Jesus need a baptism of repentance, which is what John was offering? Were there sins that he needed to have forgiven? Of course we know that the answer is no. But Jesus chose to be baptized to fully identify with the people that he came to save. In entering the water, Jesus confessed our sins on our behalf. Jesus' journey picks up speed as he resolutely takes a path that would end with him nailed to a cross. His teachings, his challenges, his parables, his healings and miracles, all markers and touch tones on the path. People would love him and they would cover his path with their cloaks and with palm branches on his entry to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And people would also be threatened by his authority and plot to kill him. So maybe this Passover meal that Jesus celebrated with his disciples really marks the beginning of the end. Passover was both a solemn and joy-filled meal. Passover was an annual religious festival, a celebration of remembrance, even a family reunion. Jews from all over Israel would make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem to celebrate. The disciples asked Jesus for directions in Matthew 26. Where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? And Jesus told them, Go into the city to a certain man and tell him, The teacher says, My appointed time is near. I am going to celebrate the Passover with my disciples at your house. And so the disciples did what Jesus had directed them and prepared Passover. While they were eating their unleavened bread, can you imagine the scene? They were remembering and reminding each other of what God had instructed them to do back in Exodus. This is an ordinance from the Lord. For seven days we are to eat unleavened bread, nothing with yeast in it. We do this because of what the Lord did for us when we came out of Egypt when the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. Then their slaughtered Passover lamb brought to mind the blood that was brushed on the door frames of their ancestors' houses. The Lord passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared their homes when the Egyptians were struck down. And as the disciples were feasting on that unleavened bread and lamb and wine, celebrating how God had delivered them from slavery in Egypt, Matthew records Jesus taking bread, giving thanks, and breaking it, and then offering it to them, saying, Take and eat. This is my body. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he offered it to them. And he said, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And Jesus transformed the Passover celebration into the Lord's Supper. It was Jesus' body broken and Jesus' blood poured out. For his disciples? For us. John the Baptist had already prepared the way by pointing to Jesus and saying, Look, that's the Lamb of God. He's taking away the sins of the world. 
At this same supper, while they were eating, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad, and they began to say to him, one after the other, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will go, just as it is written about him. But woe to the one who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. And Jesus answered, Yes, it is you. It wasn't just Judas, though, was it? Peter denied Jesus three times. And every disciple ran away when Jesus was arrested. How about us? How do we betray Jesus? I remember several years ago, I joined a yoga class with the intent to get to know people beyond my church circle of friends. One morning I was leaving class with a woman named Stacy. She asked me where I work and where I live. I told her where I lived. I held back that I worked for a church. I didn't want to be identified as the one who was a pastor or whatever label they would have used. I wanted to be just Laura at yoga. But part of my identity at that time was my work at church and why I did that work. It was because I love Jesus and more importantly, it was because Jesus loves me. And Jesus wanted Stacy to know that he loves her. I never got another chance with Stacy. I betrayed Jesus by not acknowledging my allegiance to him. Recently, I was leaving my apartment on my way to an appointment. I encountered a neighbor, another apartment dweller who lives on the same block. She was standing in the alley, which I was passing through to get to the parking lot. I did not stop and introduce myself. I didn't say, hey, I think we're neighbors. My husband and I live here too, in the apartment above Brooks. My name is Laura. I was too busy. I didn't want to be late. I denied Jesus by denying the five minutes to give to this neighbor whose name I still don't know. Surely not I, Lord. And Jesus does say, yes, it is you. It's Judas. It's Peter. It's every disciple. It's every one of us. We are all betrayers. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and to the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way here. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people and said to them, I'll punish Jesus and then I'll release him. And with one voice they cried out, Away with this man! Release Barabbas to us! Wanting to release Jesus, Pilate appealed to them again. But they kept shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! With loud shouts they insistently demanded that he be crucified. And their shouts prevailed. When I was younger, I was always so confused by those crowds yelling to crucify Jesus. Pilate gives them so many chances to change their mind, but they're so clear that Jesus must die. 
they seem bloodthirsty to see his blood flow. And I always wondered, weren't these the same crowds that threw down their cloaks when Jesus entered Jerusalem, riding a donkey on Palm Sunday? On that day, they were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! Hosanna, Jesus! But as I thought about the fickle crowds praising Jesus on Sunday and rejecting him on Friday, I realized this is me too. This is you. This is us. How do we worship God truly, truly with our whole heart? on Sunday morning. As we leave worship, we feel newly renewed and committed to following our Lord. And yet, how far are we outside of the church before Jesus fades away and we place ourselves back in the center? That crowd was angry and fickle. But our sin and our need for a savior has made our angry and accusing faces part of that crowd. As I recount Jesus' crucifixion, hear also the words of Isaiah and how he prophesied of Jesus' manner of death. The soldiers dressed Jesus up in purple and put a crown plated from a thorn bush on his head. Then they began their mockery. Bravo, king of the Jews. They banged on his head with a club. They spit on him and they knelt down in mock worship. Then they marched out to nail him to the cross. But we thought him afflicted, struck down by God and tormented. There was a man walking by, coming from work, Simon from Cyrene. They made him carry Jesus' cross. It was certainly our sickness that he carried and our sufferings that he bore. The soldiers brought Jesus to Golgotha, meaning Skull Hill. They nailed him to the cross. They divided up his clothes and threw dice to see who would get them. They nailed him up at nine in the morning, and the charge against him, the king of the Jews, was scrawled across the sign. He was pierced because of our rebellions and crushed because of our crimes. Along with him, they crucified two criminals, one to his right and the other to his left. People passing along the road jeered, shaking their heads in mock lament. Huh, you bragged that you could tear down the temple curtain temple and then rebuild it in three days. So show us your stuff. Save yourself. If you're really God's son, come down from that cross. Like sheep, we had all wandered away, each going its own way. The high priest, along with the religion scholars, were right there, mixing it up with the rest of them, having a great time poking fun at him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Messiah, is he? The king of Israel? Then let him climb down from that cross. We'll all become believers then. Even the men crucified alongside him joined in the mockery. He bore the punishment that made us whole. By his wounds we are healed. The Lord let fall on him all our crimes. The Lord let fall on him all our crimes. It was now about the sixth hour. And darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, 
into your hands I commit my spirit. And when he said this, he breathed his last. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him to the cross? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? David Bajorlin, in writing about the, the history of that hymn that I just referenced, Were You There? or the lyrics I just shared, he explains that the questions of that song call us to remember crucifixion in a way that brings Jesus' death to us, to our present. He says, these historic events are part of our story. So when the hymn says or asks, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Our answer? Well, no. And yes, because we still participate in Jesus being nailed to the cross through our daily sin committing. It was our sin that held Jesus on the cross. Joseph from the Judean town of Arimathea asked for Jesus' body. Then he took it down, wrapped it in linen cloth and placed it in a tomb cut in the rock, one in which no one had yet been laid. The women saw the tomb and how his body was laid in it, and then they went home and prepared spices and perfumes. This summer, I officiated at the funeral of a dear friend. Because of the pandemic, the funeral was private by invitation only. But many more gathered at the cemetery where she would be buried. And as we arrived from the funeral home, all of her friends and family were standing there, standing on the grass, in a sense, honoring her in, their, in her death as they stood there. Sort of a beautiful sight. After the graveside service, we all hugged each other. We exchanged a few words. We shed some more tears. We all went home. With the knowledge that our friend's life was now over, we all had to figure out how to keep on living without our friend, without our mother, without our fiance, without our daughter, without our sister, without our aunt, without our cousin. As Joseph and the women walked away from that tomb, they believed Jesus' life was over. They were left trying to figure out how in the world they were going to keep living without their rabbi, their master, their Lord, their Messiah. It was the end. For us too, on this night, this is where our journey ends.